Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. Tonight, former, oh, excuse me. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Trey Grayson, uh, the former director of the IOP, who is with us today. And he's also, in his own right, um, such an inspiration to people, especially around voting time. He was a former Secretary of State for the state of Kentucky. And people don't really have an idea of how important this job is, because this is really about making sure that people are focused on voting. And so I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying this right now, Trey, I'm inviting you back with other secretaries of state, not to take my job, oh, with other, <laughs> forget about it, uh, with other secretaries of state really to kind of focus on what they do, because it's so very important. As I said, Trey was here before, and many people know him, but I want you to know, Trey, that among the IOP directors, you rank as a high favorite among the students. And so we're just so happy that you are here today. Thank you, Thank you. It's great to be with all of you today. It's great to be back in the forum. I think the last time I was here in the forum, in a forum, was in uh, April or May of 2014, right before I went back home to Kentucky. Um, I'm really excited to have my two daughters in the front row, if I can take a moderator's privilege. Um, my older daughter, Alex, we're here for a college tour and my younger daughter, Kate, and Kate said, I really want to go to a forum when we're in town visiting, and this whole week's about Alex, because we're visiting all these schools. I want, I want to go to a forum. And so when I looked at the IOP's forum schedule, and I saw that Senator Ayotte was going to be a visiting fellow this week, I was like, that's great, we're going to go see that one on Thursday night. So we, we scheduled our whole week around this, and then last week they reached out and said, hey, would you mind um, moderating? I'm like, yes, that's awesome. So uh, anyway, it's great to be with all of you. Um, I'm really pleased to be on the stage tonight with Senator Kelly Ayotte, who served a term um, representing New Hampshire in the United States Senate. Um, we ran together, we actually met um, uh, in 2010, we both ran for the United States Senate in 2010. She had a better 2010 than I did. Uh, she <laughs> won her race, uh, she won her primary and won her general election. I joked, I had a 20, my 2011 was better because that's when I got to be the IOP director. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so we ran and got to know each other then, uh, served a stellar term. We're gonna talk about that, talk about her start in politics, talk about some of the things she's been up to lately. Uh, we'll, we'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience to ask questions. Uh, she spent the last couple days as a visiting fellow, uh, doing some things here at the Kennedy School, at the School for Public Health, uh, some breakfast this morning. So some of you may have gotten a chance to spend some time. Uh, so this is, I guess, your last day as a visiting fellow. It is. Right? Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. And you're just, you know, she's from New Hampshire, so she's right up, right up Route 3, so, uh, <laughs> uh, or 93 or 2, whatever, whichever road from New Hampshire. All roads lead to New Hampshire. <laughs> They actually do, and especially if you want to run for president, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's just start with New Hampshire. I mean, you, um, your first run for office was in 2010, but you were the attorney general, and in New Hampshire, that's an appointed position. You were appointed first by a Republican and then reappointed by a, a Democrat. Um, how did you like, like politics? Like, you know, everybody in New Hampshire has to love politics, right, because of the, the first in the nation primary. How, what, tell us about you and politics. Yeah, well, Trey, exactly. Politics is a little bit of, uh, it's basically New Hampshire sport. So uh, it's hard not to at least have some interaction with politics if you live in New Hampshire. And, you know, so, but that, that wasn't a driving force for me growing up in New Hampshire. And uh, really for me, it was uh, being kind of getting on an unexpected path to public service. <laughs> and then being in the Attorney General's office that led to uh, my interest in, in running for office. But it is really um, different because most Attorney Generals are elected. There's a handful across the country that are appointed. New Hampshire is one of them. And I had uh, been appointed to that position originally by a Republican governor and then twice reappointed by a Democratic governor. And has I actually been reappointed for a full term when uh, Judd Gregg decided he wasn't going to run again and and then um, kind of opportunity opened there and a new path opened uh, to run for office. But running for your first time for the United States Senate is a little crazy. 
uh, because if you've, I'd never even been involved in a campaign before I was involved in my own first campaign mm -hmm. for statewide office. So um, those of you that are interested in electoral politics, I would recommend you know helping someone else on a campaign first. <laughs> uh, that would have been helpful to me yeah. <laughs> just to know what I was getting fully into. So your first parade, your first door you knocked oh, on, yeah. your first I fundraising mean, phone I mean, call. I've been to parades and you know part yeah. of it. Yeah, of course, yeah. all of it, all of it new. The first stump speech. That's actually a you know, putting together what, what's your pitch, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, a stump, pit, stump speech is the pitch. You've got to go in and convince people and that they should vote for you when there's lots of people running against you and what's different about you and why, why you versus them. Well, let's talk about, let, maybe specifically, the decision to run in 2010. What was it mm -hmm. that, obviously, there was an open Senate seat, so there was an opportunity that didn't exist previously, but what was it, uh, you know, how did that happen? Was it something you were thinking about? Did people reproach you, a little bit of both? Uh, yeah, I actually thought, um, because I was attorney general and I'd worked with a couple of governors, that if I were to ever get involved in electoral politics that I might run for governor because that was just more logical. I had been working in state government uh, for a decade. And so the Senate opportunity came because there was a lot happening in Washington that I was following. And I had an opinion about it and a pretty strong opinion. Um, and at the same time, I, you know, we're looking at what's happening. Judd Gregg decides he's not going to run again. And then I thought there was another series of kind of prominent political players in our state that were going to step up and run. And when they didn't, uh, then people were thinking, I was thinking, well, maybe this is something that, that I would do. But also there were people that came to me, like Judd Gregg, um, who was my predecessor, said, we, we, I think you, you'd be a great senator, and I, you know, I think you should think about doing this. I think you could be successful at it. And people that I respected, that I knew, who encouraged me, and that helped a lot, because if you've never run for office before, you have all these questions like, okay, I can't self-fund this campaign. How do right. I figure this out? I've never run a campaign. Who's going to do that? How, how am I going to figure that out? So there's a ton of questions. Um, and in our family, the other question for us was, we are a two-income family, mm -hmm. and I thought that I should resign as attorney general if I were going to do it, because attorney general is a very nonpartisan position in New Hampshire in particular, because it was an appointed position. So I had to resign my job and take a year and a half off from work to do this. And so we kind of worked out our home finances too and say, hey, does this make sense for us? Can we swing it? Um, and so there were a lot that went into the decision. Yeah. But in the end, when you get an opportunity, timing is everything in politics. Yeah. It really is. And when a window opens on an opportunity and you decide, hey, I have a passion for this, I want to do this, uh, there's something I, you know, and I felt that, at the, I felt very compelled at the time. And that window, you either seize that moment or you don't because you may never have that window open where there's a, an opportunity to run where you can be successful again. So we decided to go for it, and we had no idea what we were getting into, and that was probably good. <laughs> <laughs> so you jump in. Um, you started, I think, running in 2009, probably, right? Yes, or, I yeah. did in 2009. July yeah. of uh, 2009, I resigned as attorney okay. general, and basically uh, two weeks later, after wrapping up my affairs in the office, I started in a closet with one guy on a campaign. Yeah. And we were looking at each other going, okay, what do we do next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, and then you just travel the state and yeah, raise money. Yeah. I mean, you start with one person. Yeah. Literally, a friend yeah. gave me a closet in their office. And we started on that and kind of went from there and built. Yeah. And you had, New Hampshire has a late primary. Um, and so your primary was like August or September. Uh, but in the early part of 2010, so you've been campaigning for a couple months. It's going well. And then this... Uh, Rick Martelli, I think is his last name, the, on CNBC does this rant and the Tea Party movement is born in 2010. Yes, that was interesting. Yeah, talk about that because you're kind of the establishment's preferred candidate, which right. I'm familiar with that. You know what this is like, yeah, Trey, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, You've lived this. Yeah, so how did, uh, how did that work out? Because, I mean, it obviously worked out. You won, but, yeah. but it changed very much. The, the primary probably became a lot different than it, you would have expected. It was really an interesting time because the Tea Party movement was coming um, really building at that point. And I had gotten into this race and I had been encouraged by, I thought, some pretty big players in the Republican Party. So I'm like, okay, this is good to have them on my side. And lo and behold, the sort of Tea Party movement comes out and three, three guys get in the primary against me. 
right? So all of a sudden what I thought the general election was going to be my toughest race, it wasn't. It was three, um, three people got in the primary, one who was able to significantly self-fund a campaign, mm -hmm. so a very successful business guy who put a lot of money and millions of dollars in the primary campaign. And it, it did become a very different race. And in fact, it was a race where, uh, you know, we'd be, I'd be, at, I'd be at tea party rallies. I mean, we'd be at rallies where we'd all t talk and, you know, we'd all yeah. give our stump speech and, and a very vigorous primary. You've got to get the nomination of your party first. And that's, that can be, you know, as, as you know, mm -hmm. that, that race is, is, can be very, just as tough as a general election, depending on what, what state you're in. And I won my primary in the end only by 1,662 votes. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> um, so I'm, I have all these close elections, right? So, yeah. so that one was really close yeah. too. And so you, then you immediately had to pivot it to a general election, mm -hmm. unify the party and run. And so uh, talk about that shift. Uh, this is where then all of a sudden the, the momentum of the Tea Party was probably advantageous because it brought a lot of enthusiasm to Republican candidates in 2010. It did. It actually was um, a lot of energy in 2010. And what I thought was going to be a much more challenging general election, I beat my general election opponent, who was a very legitimate candidate, who was a sitting congressman at the time by 22 points in New Hampshire. And so, I mean, we're generally a swing state, so mm -hmm. that, was, that was a very big margin um, coming from 1,662 votes in, in the primary. So that energy did get a lot of voters out, and independents that were voting more on the Republican side in 2010. Um, and flash forward to my last election, where the primary wasn't really the, the big race. The big race was the general election. So every election is different. And, ev and when you run for office, you need to recognize that the dynamic in every election on the ground is different, and what, what is happening really drives yeah. what the race is like. Let me ask just a policy question. When you were campaigning, you talked about you know, developing a stump speech. What was your message when you ran for Senate? And then we can talk you know, yeah. about what When I ran happened. in 2010. In 2010, yeah. Like yeah. When you ran the first time, what was oh, your message? My, was my message in 2010 uh, was very much against Washington. And it was, I mean, I was, a, I was not an incumbent, I was an insurgent. And I was running um, on what had happened with healthcare law, um, on out of control spending mm -hmm. in Washington, and really um, some things that, um, on some national security issues as well. And also my husband has a small business, so sort of, you know, what Washington was doing to our smaller businesses. Yeah. And so that was sort of the dynamic in 2010. And having a, uh, an incumbent congressman as your opponent was a nice foil well, uh, it, to, to kind of look at me like he's been there, he's part of the problem. It kind of was, especially in a 2010 race, yeah, right? Yeah. Where there's this Tea Party frustration movement with uh, what is happening in Washington. So it's, you know, that's why I say every race is a little different and it's different when you're an incumbent, obviously. You know, yeah. you're running, what are you gonna run against yourself in, in terms of running against Washington in that sense? So, so you get elected, you go to Washington, and one of the things, we talked about this in the green room, and I wanted to bring see this up here. You became famous for becoming the third Amiga of the yeah. three Amigos <laughs> with Senator John McCain, Senator Lindsey Graham. Yes. Talk about that. I thought it was interesting how you told me how that, uh, how that started, really right after the election, kind of with that trip. So after the election, um, after I got elected, uh, Mitch McConnell, who was then the minority leader, those of us who got elected in 2010, he took us with him on a trip to Afghanistan um, right away, right after we had been elected at the beginning of the year, before we had even picked committee assignments. And uh, that trip, uh, one of the senators that went on that trip was uh, Lindsey Graham. But what that trip did for me is, as a senator, you have such broad responsibility but you also have to decide what areas do you want to develop a particular expertise in yourself. And traveling to Afghanistan really hit home for me and visiting our troops there, how important these issues are and how important when we have um, men and women who are fighting overseas for us that that can impact every single thing that happens for us at home. It impacts our national security. And it just, that trip made me think very much 
as I put in my committee assignments that I really should put in. My husband's also a combat pilot, um, or is a retired combat pilot, but it made me think that I should put in for the Armed Services Committee. And so that's what prompted me mm -hmm. to do that, and I, I got, that's one of the committees I got assigned to. And very quickly, um, early on, I had always admired uh, from afar uh, Senator McCain, actually not even from afar, because when I campaigned, uh, he actually came to New Hampshire and did a town hall. My first town hall ever was with John McCain. That's pretty cool. It was really cool. <laughs> and yeah. so he would actually yeah. came and campaigned for me when I ran. Um, but uh, I started working on some issues in the Armed Services Committee that I was interested in related to detainee policy and to detainees at Guantanamo and our overall policy toward them. And as a result, as a new senator, I filed in our first defense authorization like 25 motion, tw basically 25 amendments on this one issue, right? So Senator McCain sends Senator Graham to me to say, what, what is this, what is she doing, you know? Why is, is she, you know, mucking up the works with all these <laughs> amendments on the, because I'm a new senator, right? I'm like, okay, right. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about this. And, uh, and so over that, I struck up a friendship with Senator Graham and McCain, and I became very interested in this detainee policy issue and started working with them on it. And at the same time, when I got to the Senate, I was also assigned Joe Lieberman as a mentor on the Democratic side. And so I had always um, admired him in many ways. So all those things came yeah. together, and we just started, I started working with them and learning from them. And, and then eventually, I, I issues came up where, um, you know, I, I had started to develop my own expertise on it, and then kind of became, a, I guess, a third Amiga in some yeah. ways after Joe left. Yeah, so for those who don't, Joe, Joe Lieberman was the third Amiga. He really is the third, third Amigo. Amigo. Yeah. I mean, there's no replacing Joe. You're the first Amiga. I'm, the, I'm an Amiga, yeah. 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 Um, so <laughs> there's no replacing Joe, who's a wonderful person. But, uh, but I learned a lot from them. And you find that you make alliances in the Senate. And you also find that they're part of what you do is really get an opportunity to delve in on certain issues where you become more of a go-to person mm -hmm. on those issues for other members of the Senate. So, so national security, foreign affairs became one of those buckets. What were some of the other uh, go-to areas where yeah. you felt like you really got to become an expert and a resource for senators and, and then maybe areas where you really focused your legislative? Well, for me, um, today I spoke at the TH Chan Public Health mm -hmm. Center about the opiate crisis. Yeah. And my state has been, New Hampshire has been devastated uh, I'm by, hoping you can say this because this Kentucky's been devastated. Oh, and Ke is, Kentucky, yeah, exactly, yeah. has been the same by heroin and opiate epidemic, in part fueled by the misuse or overuse of prescription drugs, but and then also the use of heroin and a deadly drug called fentanyl. And so your state, what happens in your state and what you see happening often drives what you're going to focus on too. So that's something I worked with. Uh, Rob Portman, mm -hmm. Republican from Ohio, and Amy Klobuchar, a Democrat from Minnesota, and Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island. The four of us got together, and we worked for two years on a bill that got passed called the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act to really focus on, from a public health perspective primarily on how we, uh, we deal with this, this epidemic that's hitting, hitting so many states. That's an area, also, also mental health issues, and improving our mental health system was something that I dived into um, very much because I think uh, there's a lot of co-occurring disorders uh, between people who are struggling with addiction and mental health, and mental health impacts so many other areas of public health. So that was another area that I focused on. So in, in 2012, again, you know, you're in New Hampshire, right? So all the presidency comes alive. Yeah. And you, you endorsed Mitt Romney fairly early, as I remember? Or? I actually endorsed Mitt uh, it was the November before the, uh, then I November think, 11? Jan yeah. Yeah, January primary, so yeah. it was about a month and a half. And then I, you know, I went and campaigned everywhere with him in New Hampshire, so I introduced him in so many different places in New Hampshire, and it was really fun. Yeah, um, we were talking, I saw you, I think, at a general election event uh, with, yeah. with Chris Christie. With, oh, yeah. yeah. I was at a town hall with, up on this huge stage at this high school yeah. with Chris Christie and Mitt and... And you know, Chris Christie in a town hall is so raucous, right? So mm -hmm. he's like calling people out in the crowd and I'm like, what am I, what is yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little more mellow than that. So that yeah. was just like, it was kind of fun. You're New, Ham New Hampshire nice, right? Right, like, yeah. yeah. So Chris was like, you, you, He was there. New Jersey, New Jersey, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is kind of fun. I yeah. Don't know. 
Yeah. Now, you, let me ask if you can say, were you, I mean, there was rumors that you were maybe under some consideration for the vice presidency uh, nomination. Was that, did they, were you on a list at some point, do you think? You know, I, you know that? I, I, I was told that, yeah, I certainly was someone who was looked at um, if there had been a Romney administration, maybe not fully in that capacity, yeah. but yeah. Um, for, for other potential positions and I got to know Mitt and Ann well and they're you know they're great people yeah and they spent a lot of time in New Hampshire yeah so, and yeah. they actually had a really organized um, governor uh, Levitt from Utah was their transition person and he had a really like organized process and was really ahead of the curve so I think they were thinking about those things yeah, well in yeah. advance one thing I've always heard in the Senate that the women senators regardless of party have this relationship with one another mm -hmm. do you want to is that true? And if so, I want to talk a little bit about that. So we now have, uh, we have 21 women who are in the Senate right now. Uh, the most that's ever been in the Senate in the history of the country. There's actually fewer than 50 senators that have been women in the history of the country who have served. And five of them are Republicans, but the women senators actually get together for dinner once every uh, few months. So about once a quarter and just get together it's not always, it's not around a policy issue necessarily, just to get together and chat about issues. And I, I think that has built a relationship uh, that's kind of fun and getting to know each other on a personal level. And that's something that's really helpful, getting to know, you know, there's only 100 senators, getting to know your fellow senators on a more personal level, because uh, there's a lot of team meetings, right? Republicans mm -hmm. meet with Republicans, Democrats meet with Democrats, and so, to make those uh, you know, cross-party relationships are pretty helpful if you want to know someone so you can bridge the idea of let's work together on this matter to get, get address this issue. And, and speaking of the theme of women, New Hampshire has had an extraordinary run the last few years yes. of women dominating the congressional races and the statewide offices. Um, what's in the water up there? Like, what can we, can we bottle that and get it to other states? And, and uh, I've just been really yeah, impressed with that. Yeah, I mean, that. I think in New Hampshire, it's just not an issue. Right, um, meaning that we've had so many women, and now we have all all women. And, and this isn't this is the second time we've had all an all women, all female delegation. So I think you kind of once it happens, it's as someone who served as the first woman attorney general, I always used to like to say, yeah, it's great to be the first. But the good news about being the first is I won't be the last, right? Yeah. And I just think that once that happens, it just kind of builds on itself and the best person wins, whether mm -hmm. man or woman. So, in, and I, we gotta talk about 2016. So in 2016, you actually ran against um, Maggie Hassan, who was the then governor mm -hmm. of New Hampshire, another um, woman, and it was, a, it was a tough race, it was a close race, and not the, out, the there's a reason why you're here as a visiting fellow. Yes, it was a very a, close uh, race. That yeah. one was like 1,015 votes, so yeah. I like to have <laughs> close races that yeah. I am engaged in. And so I, I in case anyone wonders, your vote does matter. Yeah. So yeah. when people come to me and say, my vote doesn't matter, I go, no, let me tell you about my races. Your vote matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, um, so you ran and obviously um, she gets in the race. She's, a, a two, I think, governor for four years. So you knew you were going to be in for a tough race. Um, what, was, you know, what, were, what were some of the issues that, I mean, obviously there was a, there was a disagreement on a lot of things from a philosophical mm -hmm. agreement. You kind of got wrapped up into the larger um, national mood and national. Yeah, I yeah. think one of the challenging things about running in 2016 is that in a presidential year, you're always going to be kind of subject to what happens in the presidential race. And this year, that was on steroids, right? So, um, you know, so much of what you wanted to talk about on the campaign every day about your ideas or differences you had with your opponent on your ideas, the media would come back to what, what was said at the top of the ticket on both sides. Mm -hmm. And so that was the real tough uh, part about running in a year like this. And uh, so, yeah, we had obviously substantive policy differences between myself and Senator Hassan um, that were pretty significant. And you know, often you don't always get to talk about those in a race like we had this year. And, you, and I guess the other thing you had that was interesting is you had, since it was an open presidency, again, the New Hampshire primary. So this wasn't just in the fall. This would have started really in, you know, right all the way through the primary yeah. of this presidential race overshadowing. It, it would. I mean, yeah. it starts in the, the primary. And of course, we have every political reporter in our state on every corner. 
And then sometimes, you know, they, they like to cover your race as an extension of the presidential race, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it gets subsumed that way. Uh, so it does happen pretty quickly. And in fact, um, it, but it's a great thing about being in New Hampshire, though. It is cool mm -hmm. that I always say to people, you know, in New Hampshire and young people in New Hampshire, I'm like, well, go see all the candidates because so many states, you don't get that opportunity, right? You, you know, somebody lands mm -hmm. on a tarmac, they do a speech and they leave. Not in New Hampshire. You can actually go see each of the candidates and get pretty up close and personal. So that, that's a really yeah. I mean, there, cool side of it. There are New Hampshire residents, correct me if I'm wrong, who will never vote for a candidate if, if you haven't met them. Yeah, well, there definitely are. And yeah. some <laughs> want to meet you more than once, right? Yeah. So it's real, it's that kind of politics. I, I will say uh, our race was a very big Senate race. So it was, you had the presidential race and you also had who's going to, which party is going to control the Senate. And I think many people thought that control the Senate would actually come down to New Hampshire. So it was in terms of an advertising race, nothing like my first race. My first race between primary and general was I raised $5 million altogether. And my se the race I just went through, each of us as candidates raised $20 million. Wow. So inside the campaign, 20 Inside million. the campaign. Yeah. But here's the number you need to hear about, which the total number was $140 million. So each candidate wow. raised 20 each, but 100 million from outside spending. So that creates a different dynamic too in a race where, you know, the advertising dollars in such a small state, even though you have to buy Boston TV, so it makes it expensive, but it's still, uh, you know, it really makes it a different race than, for example, my first race. So keeping on the focus of sort of the differences between 10 and 16, so you get the presidential framework, which didn't exist in 10, You've got all this extra money. I'm also curious, just from a like from technology or other things, what other things were different maybe six years later? That because oh, campaigns yeah. evolve, and it'd just be interesting to see. Because I ran in ten, so I know what you know. I know what we did in ten, and we were sort of state of the art. And I can't imagine six years later with the technology and the data and everything else, were some of the other things that may have been that might be different it, that it, wouldn't be as obvious to um, folks who follow. Well, the race. it may be that I probably much more obvious to the students who are here. Yeah that campaigns have completely evolved. They're, you know, we're all looking at the use of data and how is data used to be able to understand where people are coming from, what their viewpoints are, uh, what their interests are, and how they align and how you message to them. And so that has changed and campaigns are now using data to figure out, you know, if I'm someone who has worked on certain areas that you care about, what do you care about? Are you someone who's an undecided voter? Or, and how do we message to you, not just through the television, but online? If we come to your door, you know, what kinds of questions and what kinds of issues should we be presenting to you? And all of that has become so much more sophisticated and it's gonna continue to be. Yeah. But it's no different than what we see in the advertising realm and in so many areas where the questions are, what, what do we do with this kind of consumer data that we have about people? So in, in 2016, it we talked a little bit about this. Um, you had a strange relation, or not maybe that's the right word. You struggled with the top of the ticket nomination, as a lot of Republicans, me included. Um, um, and so Trump wins, and he calls you, or somebody from the campaign, uh, the, the administration calls you the to ask a, White, yeah, not, yeah, not the president, yeah, but not, the, uh, someone who works at the White House. Yeah, yeah. to ask you a favor um, to uh, help out with a pretty important selection and a nomination. Uh, for Supreme Court, so yes. talk a bit, talk a bit about that and, and that whole experience of uh, of now Justice Gorsuch. Well, you get when you're me, and you know, given the campaign I just came through and, and the history um, that I had throughout the campaign uh, with our now president, is that when you get the call from the White House, basically on January, I think it was the day that the justice was going to be nominated. When you get that call and you're like, you're calling from where? <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually really surprised that they called yeah. me. Um, and it's, what I looked at was, I very strongly believe the Supreme Court, I have a legal background, uh, is such an important, um, plays such an important role obviously in our democracy and the separation of powers in, uh, in the branches of government. and. So I wanted to make, I, I thought that was something that I would get behind 
to help someone who I thought was very qualified to serve on the United States Supreme Court and to bring um, Justice Gorsuch uh, through that process. But I have to tell you, having just lost a Senate election and going back and actually doing almost 80 senators meetings, meetings with senators from the other side, right, where you, you know, you're, not the, you're not in the senator asking the mm -hmm. questions anymore, you're sitting in each of these meetings, that was quite an experience, having just come off an election. And, um, but it was a good experience in that I learned a lot listening from that side. And then I also got to know a Supreme Court justice really well, spending eight to 10 hours a day with them. So uh, that was interesting. And I have a friend there and yeah. he's, a, he's a, a great guy on a personal level. So, so it was an interesting yeah. experience. So that's when they say that when you read about shepherding a nomination, that's literally you're going all those meetings, you, you are, do the introductions and you sit there. I'm and, bring, yeah, I brought yeah. him around to 80 plus Senate meetings and brought him in. And, you know, I had in the Senate, I tried to work in a bipartisan fashion. So I think they reached out to me because I do have good relationships, not just within my own party, but across party, you know, across, uh, across the aisle. And so I could walk into any Senate office uh, with uh, Justice Gorsuch and hopefully uh, introduce him and, and help him through that process. And so I did that. But I was also involved in the preparation so so-called moots and murder, murder, murder boards of mm -hmm. preparing him for the hearing. And so I had my crash course back again in constitutional law. Yeah. So that, that was a, kind of bringing me back to my lawyer days. Yeah, okay. Well, I wanna ask one more question and we're gonna open up to the audience. We've got a couple of uh, microphones throughout and just a reminder to the audience at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, we have some rules. It's so cool to be able to say this again. There's three of them. So one is uh, go to the audience, go to the microphone and introduce yourself and tell us your affiliation. Uh, the second is, it's a question, it's not a speech, and a question ends in a question mark. Uh, what's the third, or I just combined them into? Oh, the question mark, yeah, and then it's a question. So there are three rules here. Um, <laughs> so we want, you know, please come up and ask some questions. We wanna bring you into the conversation. But I, I have to ask, because um, I get asked the same question, would you, would you like to run again someday? I'll just ask it very openly and vaguely, not like, you know, run for governor in two years or center or whatever, <laughs> but just in general, I mean, the, it's uh, it's really too soon yeah. to say for me. Um, I spent 20 years in public service and it was incredibly rewarding and I loved it even on its most frustrating, difficult day. Um, so I'll find ways to serve, Sorry. certainly. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm young and I'm sure I'll find ways to serve again, but running for office? Not quite sure yeah. yet. Yeah, it's about the service and yeah, yeah. Maybe that's not the right way to serve uh, in future. I just came through a pretty challenging campaign so yeah but I never say never <laughs> yeah no, I kind of said the same thing it was you probably never say never either <laughs> yeah no I was really I, I was really glad to come to the IOP and still be around politics and serve in that yes. way but it's um losing stinks actually and that's I, I, I'd actually be more colorful than that but I'm you know it's we're yeah exactly the, we're not going to use that kind of language right yeah crowd. I don't want to see that on YouTube <laughs> later on exactly um, so when we start with this microphone and we'll just alternate go through uh, hi I'm uh, Jackson I'm a freshman at the college um, I just had a question about uh, working across the aisle and bipartisan uh, policy in the future, especially given our significant differences across party lines. Yeah. Uh, how do we reconcile these differences to work for the American people? Yeah, thank you. I, th I think this is the, the key question, right? And I like to think about it in two ways. N number one, obviously, as an elected leader, I have a responsibility not just to tell you about what I want to accomplish, but have some results to show for it. And I think it's hard to show results in the context of a legislative body if you aren't willing to reach out um, and try to solicit people that have, have a, from a different party, um, find the common ground, and be willing to compromise. Otherwise, I don't see how you can, on major issues especially, but on most issues, y you know, you can't do it unless you're willing to do that. So I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to, you know, to do that and to show some political courage in doing that. That said, also the voters. What are the voters valuing? Um, what is it then when you go and you vote, are you valuing? Do you just have a litmus test where there are 10 issues and if that person just checks every box for me, then that's who I'm voting for? Um, that's not necessarily gonna result in getting the kind of person in who is someone who will reach out or someone who is willing uh, to compromise where appropriate, 
who is willing to show some courage. So I think we need to ask the you know, voters, to all of us, we all have a role in it, uh, as citizens to say, okay, what are we going to value? Um, and there needs to be more value uh, placed on bipartisanship, on coming together, on getting things done. And then also, when we have these big money races, what is, is people have these one issues, right? And so the money comes in on the one issue as opposed to the people being focused on the person and who's, and what, what are we, what is that person going to do to compromise and get things done? And I think that contributes to do it too. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jackson. Great first question. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Will. I'm a sophomore here at the college. Um, and as an onlooker from New England and something that you alluded to in your talk, um, New Hampshire is a very politically unique state, especially given the climate uh, in New England. So I'm wondering what were some of the challenges that you experienced in your six years in office about representing the entire state of New Hampshire, um, especially given its kind of unique tradition in New England politics? Well, one thing that you know about representing New Hampshire, Will, is that you have to you have to actually want to go talk to your constituents. So it's not a, it, it, we're not a big state, right? And so, but also a state that is used to meeting, if you want, every president or potential president, <laughs> right? So they're not that impressed with their senator, okay? <laughs> but they do expect to see their senator and they do expect you to be out and meeting them and at events. And, you know, so you have to be very engaged, I think, to represent New Hampshire. Uh, in any capacity. And you have to be willing to put yourself out there to represent New Hampshire. I did town halls, I've been yelled at, I've been, you know, mm -hmm. you, you've gotta be willing to do that. Uh, so I think that's important. But just like any state, every state when you represent a whole state is gonna have different parts of the state that have different issues that are, and I think you have to recognize the geographic differences in New Hampshire, the North Country versus Portsmouth, versus where I live in the southern part of the state, the issues are different. And you know, recognizing those issues when you go to an area of the state, recognizing what you can do uniquely in each area of the state to address their concerns is important as well, and really getting to know those local issues. And your staff can help you a ton with that as well. Thanks. Yes. Uh, my name is Jaws Lima Jr. at the college. Um, my question is about specific policy and what your opinion is. Sure. So you know that um, there were airstrikes in Syria and just today they used mm -hmm. the most powerful bomb in Afghanistan. I was just wondering what you think as a Republican. Oh, uh, I, I will tell you that I agreed uh, with the cruise missile strikes in Syria. And um, I agreed that it was a move that sent a message in terms of the use of chemical weapons. Uh, by Bashar Assad, and I think it also sent a broader message uh, that we were not going to tolerate uh, the use of those types of weapons. Uh, the question I think now is what's the follow-on policy, and is there going to be a broader policy by the Trump administration to change the dynamic on the ground, which will take more than a one-off uh, missile strike? And so I think that's really the fundamental question now. And I think the other thing that that strike showed is um, the president seeing the circumstances before him showed an ability to adjust because that strike was obviously different than some of the things that he had said during the campaign trail, but listening to the military advisors he had around him, uh, obviously he was able to look at the situation and say, I'm gonna take this action based on the use of chemical weapons. When it came to uh, what happened in Afghanistan, there, Afghanistan is a situation where um, you have continued to see more activity now uh, by ISIL in Afghanistan. So in addition to the fight we continue to have with the Taliban. Uh, so I haven't, I know that a certain kind of bomb was used there. I haven't fully studied all the dynamics of why that particular bomb was used in that setting. Um, but, you know, I, my assumption is, is that uh, that was trying to strike, I think, at an ISIL stronghold there. Um, I think that's what it was used. And um, I don't necessarily have a disagreement with it, but I would want to study it more uh, before I can analyze it further for you uh, based on the circumstances on the ground. 
Uh, Afghanistan is one now where we also see the Russians. Are, there have been reports uh, and testimony before the Armed Services Committee that the Russians are now supporting the Taliban to some extent and kind of um, getting involved in Afghanistan. That's not a good sign because uh, we, we already have enough difficulty in Afghanistan um, of trying to uh, keep that country uh, stable in some form. So I'm hoping that was something that was addressed by Secretary Tillerson as well. Uh, when he uh, met uh, with uh, Putin and also with Lavrov, so we'll see. Cool, thanks. Thanks. Yes. Thank you both so much for being here. Uh, my name's Evan. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and you, earlier you mentioned, and now you were just talking about Afghanistan. Of course, Afghanistan has been in the news today. Um, you served on the Armed Services Committee and you know, with uh, your husband's service in the military as well. Yep. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the conflict in Afghanistan, what the future of it is, what the future of American involvement in Afghanistan is, um, especially given some of these revelations about Russia. And uh, it, just because I think for a lot of us who don't have family members um, who are serving there, it's easy to forget that there's a conflict going on there at all. Um, yeah. So. Well, it is, I, I can understand that, um, but we, we have uh, men and women in uniform right now who are fighting not only in Afghanistan, but in Iraq and Syria as we speak here um, in very difficult circumstances and in other places around the world, but um, primarily those three places. And in Afghanistan, uh, we obviously went to Afghanistan after 9-11 uh, because that was the safe haven of Osama bin Laden and it had become a safe haven at the time the Taliban provided that haven for Al Qaeda. And we have an interest that's very strong of not allowing Afghanistan to ever become a safe haven again for terrorism. Uh, we have been engaged in Afghanistan for a long time now. And part of the challenge we faced is there's been a lot of, um, you know, I disagreed on many instances when the Obama administration of artificially uh, deciding what numbers of troops were going to be there and announcing it and then um, withdrawing so that the Taliban would grow strong again and then we'd be back in this cycle of, uh, and I think now there's a reevaluation by the Trump administration exactly how many of our troops need to be there, how much we've, we've helped uh, the Afghan uh, forces themselves, their native forces build and we've trained them, we've assisted them and how much more support we're going to continue to provide them there. But I think it's hard for people, often they think, well, this conflict has been going so long, why don't we just end it and get out, right? If we end it and get out, that will be, again, a vacuum that, again, will unfortunately, this time it may not be Al-Qaeda per se, but you see these kinds of vacuums will become perhaps a vacuum for um, ISIL, uh, which has been now um, interacting in Afghanistan. So we can't just suddenly, once we go into something, we can't just suddenly pull out and expect that the consequences aren't there. Which the lesson from all this is always, of course, every time you get in some place, you have to think very carefully as to what your exit is and how, you know, what your measure of success is going to be. And first of all, it's great we have all these undergraduate questions. Yes. And I'm excited we finally get a woman asking an undergraduate question. So come on, guys. It's been great, guys, but <laughs> good. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here, Senator. So actually, my question, my name is Katie Dolan. I'm a junior at the college. Um, my question is sort of about women, actually. Um, I think there was a lot of rhetoric in the 2016 election, particularly that the values of women and the values of conservatives were like fundamentally incompatible, um, but obviously, you are a woman and you are a Republican, so I was just wondering your I perspective. I hope they're not because. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean. um, exactly. So I was just wondering your perspective on sort of being a female conservative um, and sort of your counter argument to people who would say that that is somehow a, um, an oxymoron or something like that. Yeah, I don't think it's an oxymoron. Um, I, I am a conservative because I, I, have, I have a different view on on uh, the role of government. Um, if I look at what do I want, where do I want the majority of problems to be solved? Do I want them to be solved at the federal level or the state and local level? And what the role of government is, uh, sort of a 
Tenth Amendment view versus the federal government larger view. I'd like a smaller, more accountable government there and have most th more things happen at the state and local level. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm a conservative because I believe in fiscal responsibility and I want to make sure that we can serve uh, and have a responsible uh, funding. Um, I'm a conservative also because I, I believe in conserving things like the environment. I'd like to see our party understand that being a conservative also is about conserving everything, including our environment. Uh, so I think that uh, when people label that a conservative can't, you know, suddenly isn't for women or pro-women, um, that's, I think, basically telling women you have to believe in a certain thing, you have to just, if you're a woman, you're going to have to think a certain way. And I just, I don't buy into that. Um, you know, I, I think that it's important that for everyone, we allow freedom of thought for people to believe what they believe and respect each other's beliefs. And we can have disagreements without being disagreeable. Um, and I happen to know a lot of really strong conservative women who still serve in the Senate who are incredible and incredible role models. You know, people like Joni Ernst, who's the, you know, she's the first essentially um, combat veteran, female combat veteran, who commanded uh, a guard unit herself um, to serve in the United States Senate. And I can give you many other examples of, of strong women who are conservative. So I don't, if somebody says something within the Republican Party that I don't agree with, it doesn't mean that every Republican thinks that. And I think I could say the same thing for the Democratic Party. Hi, uh, my name is Vince Monti, and I'm a junior at the college. Uh, during the presidential election, we heard a lot about Ted Cruz's unpopularity in the Senate. So I was wondering what it was like <laughs> to work with Ted Cruz uh, as a senator. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't think there's any secret because it ended up in the New York Times, but when the government shutdown happened, I was actually the person in the Republican caucus during our lunch who stood up uh, to ask, uh, to ask Senator Cruz some tough questions about why this was, he thought this was a successful strategy. And uh, so he and I have had our vigorous debates about <laughs> issues. That said, uh, I, I get along well with him. I just saw him when I was uh, in the Senate uh, bringing around uh, Justice Gorsuch. And I think that they're, you know, coming back to the Senate after a presidential campaign. My impression is that Ted Cruz is really reaching out to his colleagues and, and making a, a much stronger effort, I think, to build relationships within the Senate. Um, I, I've seen it directly, um, and I think that it's a situation where he realized also, you know, you can believe what you believe, but having relationships in the Senate is pretty important. We're only 100 people, and you're, you're a person at the end of the day, right? And those kinds of relationships matter in terms of getting things done and working with them. But I can honestly say um, I have a good relationship with him now. I know he's recently you know, been, uh, you know, been out to dinner with people like Senator Graham and uh, <laughs> sitting down. I, yeah, that wouldn't have happened before. No, that wouldn't have happened <laughs> before. And you know, so I think you see people who disagree at one point and then they, you know, rebuild a relationship because they know it's important for the Senate as a whole. Okay. Good. Good question. Yeah. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, my name is Kenneth Landers. I support fundraising activities in the University Development Office here. Okay. Um, I should also disclose that Senator Ayotte, I had the privilege of campaigning for you via the uh, Republican State Committee in New Hampshire. It was Thank a, you. You're brave. I appreciate it. It was a <laughs> wonderful six months and I would not take it back for the world. Um, I wonder if I could get your thoughts on the recent elimination of the filibuster. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, as partisans, we're thrilled. Um, but as institutionalists, what does it mean for the Senate? What does it mean for the country? Yeah, I think uh, I, I really wish that we weren't in a situation where the filibuster uh, was eliminated. But that's how I felt also when I was in the Senate in 2013 when uh, then Majority Leader Harry Reid uh, basically and the Democrats decided that they were gonna change the 60 vote threshold for members of the cabinet so and change it for all the lower court judges. 
And so that in part set the stage uh, for where we are. Uh, obviously the Judge Garland nomination also set the stage heading into the election for where we are. Uh, but overall, the one issue that I think it's important to think about in the elimination of the filibuster is I don't feel like my former Republican co colleagues, all of whom, uh, 52 of them, voted this way because they felt that uh, Justice Gorsuch was so qualified. They're like, if they're going to filibuster this uh, mm -hmm. nominee, what choice are we left? Uh, and that's why I think they ended up doing what they did. Uh, but I know many of them didn't really want to be in that position. And so in the end, for whoever is, is uh, in office, will it, if you don't have to get support from the other side of the aisle, uh, will it change the nature of who's nominated, right? Yeah. Because if you knew you had to get 60 votes, are you more likely to nominate someone who you think can garner support, at least some support from the other sense, side of the aisle? I think the answer is probably yes. So I think you're going to see no matter who is in office, um, which party, that you, they're not they're just not gonna be as much outreach to the other side of the aisle as before the elimination of 60 vote threshold. So from an institutional perspective, that is disappointing. And I think uh, it's unfortunate that we are where we are, but it was inevitable in this nomination just when uh, the Democrats decided to block Justice Gorsuch because he really was eminently qualified. So I think a lot of my former colleagues thought, well, what choice are we left with here? Got time for two more questions, and we'll okay. both from this microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Tom Pivolite. I'm a sophomore here at the college, and I'd just like to quickly say it's nice to see you again. I don't, I'm not sure if you recall, but we met in June of 2015. Uh, I was in the Presidential Scholars Program. Oh, great, yes. Yep. Um, and I think you also know my dad. He works at Criari in Hanover. You've been there a couple of times. Yes. Any, but yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so as a New Hampshireite, I'm just kind of curious what your plans are for the immediate future because I know my dad, as a member of a small business, uh, appreciates your advocacy and, uh, and things like that. Yeah, Criari is really interesting also company because it was founded out of uh, this great program that Warren Rudman came up with called the SBA. SBIR and STTR, which was uh, these idea of, you know, putting some defense money into kind of startup new ideas, technology, instead of going through this huge bureaucracy to make it easy to come up, and Criari has created all kinds of really neat businesses from that. Um, my plans, I'm still figuring them out, right? What's the next adventure? And I'm glad to be here yeah. today. Uh, it was interesting to be there to meet a new Supreme Court justice. And I'm going to be, I've got two kids, uh, 9 and 12, so I want to be home more in New Hampshire. So I'm going to put together, I think, a combination of things from New Hampshire um, that keep me active and keep me engaged. And so I, I, I'm trying to figure out what's next. You know, we all go through periods in our life where we're figuring out what the next uh, next step in and challenges, so any advice you have, I'm open yeah. to. I appreciate it. <laughs> How did, what, did your kids move to D.C. with you? Did they, they didn't. They so in New Hampshire? When I got elected, my kids were three and six, and so I would commute back and forth every week, and I'm really fortunate that, you know, I married well, and my husband's been really supportive of it, but also we have a lot of family around us that helped me throughout that, and that's how I was able to do it. Um, but the silver lining for me in losing this election was that I can be more present at a time in my children's lives where I'm excited about being more present. But I will tell you that things come unexpectedly to you and opportunities mm -hmm. and new adventures. So uh, that has happened to me throughout my life. So I, I don't know what the next course will be. I'm sure there'll be something else. So I made the mistake of just staring this way and didn't notice there were people with other microphones. So yes, oh yeah. And I we didn't actually, see that. And I looked at my watch, make sure we a couple more. So I apologize. So why don't we? And there was a gentleman who was over this microphone. So if you want to come back to that microphone, sir, I'd be. Well, we'll end up. I with didn't. You. I felt that I didn't. Yeah, I kept either. staring over here. So anyway, yeah. we'll do these three, and then if the gentleman who's at that mic still around, we'll get, we'll get him as well. I don't. I, I got to be better at moderating. I'm a little rusty. I'm sorry. It's been a couple Thank years. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Reed McMurtry. I'm a sophomore. Uh, I had the pleasure of volunteering on your campaign a little bit. It was a lot of fun. 
Uh, but I'm just curious to know if in retrospect you wish you hadn't distanced yourself as much from Donald Trump. Um, it seems that some of the swing state senators who didn't denounce him as much as you did were able to win re-election and hold on. Uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts are now, especially since your race was so, so, so close. Um, when I made the decision, when the Access Hollywood tapes came out, uh, that I, uh, at that point, could no longer vote for him, and then I made the decision to write in Mike Pence. Um, that was a really very personal decision for me. It was not a political decision, because I knew that um, that held its risk within my own party. Um, but, you know, I, as I said at the time, my daughter is 12, and I just thought, you have to do what you think is right. Um, under those circumstances, and I did. So to go back and revisit that decision, you know, I did what I thought was right. And so at the end of the day, and at the end of your life, I think that's, those are the moments, despite the consequences, that you have to look back and say, um, you do what you think is right. And sometimes the consequences can be significant. Um, I will tell you, though, in terms of races, if you look at what happened in the Senate races, every state that President Trump won, the senator won. Uh, he did not win my state. Uh, he came closer than others, but I actually- You got more votes than him, I right? got more votes than yeah. him. I got, I think, 7,000 plus more votes than him. So, it, uh, so I don't know that that actually would have changed the dynamics of my race. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, I will tell you that uh, one of the reasons that I decided also in thinking through whether I would help on the Supreme Court is also he's, not, he's our president, and I hope that all of us as Americans would want him to succeed, so to succeed for the basis of our country. Uh, so that was an area where I felt I could help, uh, and I did. Great, thanks. Yes. Hi, Senator. Uh, my name is Ryan LaMonica. I'm a junior at the college. Um, so it seems like kind of at all levels of government in the past, I don't know how many years, two decades maybe, um, we've reached the point where the mo we're the most divided in terms of party. Um, and obviously, it, you know, you shouldn't have to say this, but being bi bipartisan is kind of rare now. Um, being able to work across the aisle is rare. Um, so I was kind of wondering, why do you think it's gotten this way, and what are some practical solutions going forward to uh, mm -hmm. address the political divide? You know, I think that there has been, you know, more polarization. I think part of it is that first you have to, you've got red states, you've got blue states, you've got to get your party's nomination first, and sometimes that nomination process, uh, obviously, if that's really what's going to decide in a lot of instances in those red and blue states, uh, who gets the nomination, there, there tends to be then a focus on one segment of your voting population as opposed to thinking more broadly. Uh, so you've seen more polarization happen mm -hmm. in that way. Um, and I also think, again, to go back to what I said at the beginning, you know, what are we, what are we valuing um, when we go and vote for someone? If we're a member of a party, I get it, we're going to you know, vote for a member of our party, but there's a lot of people who are registered as independents who are swing voters. And, you know, what are, what are they valuing? Are they going to value more of a, a test-based uh, approach or more of a problem-solving approach? So I think focusing on if we want problems solved, you better elect someone who actually is willing to try to solve a problem, and that means that I don't always get my way every single piece of what I want in something if I want to get something done. The other thing is, is that I think as elected leaders, uh, you should expect your, the people you elect um, to reach out and, and to, find, to look for ways to find common ground instead of always trying to, you know, make you know, make the headline of being the purist, but find the way to, 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 to make the common ground. And I certainly tried to do that, and I think it's important that we do do that as elected leaders, because otherwise we're gonna to continue to have some pretty strong festering problems in the country that uh, only can be solved unless, if people are willing to show some political courage and do so. 
Can I just ask a quick follow up on the reform question? Sure. I think I know in the presidential races, the primaries are open in the sense that independents can vote. Yeah, in, in New party. Hampshire, is they that are in your too. in your uh, Senate so primaries? In, in New Hampshire, you can vote as an independent in either, and I like it. I think it's a good. Yeah. I think I like the way our state does it. I think it's a fair process. And you think that can, maybe in your state it, it maybe brings the candidates a little bit closer to the mean because of the fact that you could have others come in and or at least have independents come in and vote. You can have independents yeah. too. But now if you're an independent, you have to you have to for purposes of that election declare that you're voting as a Republican or a Democrat. So you do have to make that step and then you have to take the step of undeclaring. But I think it I think that's actually a good process. Um, you're really actually going to only see an independent who's really focused on a particular election to do that in one of those races. But I think mm -hmm. having a broader group of people being able to vote is a good thing. I think it's been good in our state. Yeah. Um, and it, it hasn't diminished either party or the strength of either party in doing so or their role. Okay. All right. Now you're going to get the last question. I need to wait a little bit. Um. <laughs> Hello, my name is Anastasia, and I'm a visiting fellow at Davis Center. Uh, and I, also, I wanted to ask about um, the priorities that you had during your campaign, because you told that you should tailor it somehow to a larger agenda, presidential race, for instance. Uh, so have you noticed any significant changes of the agenda during uh, the latest time? And uh, um, as Trump has brought I think more unpredictability uh, into foreign policy and internal American policy also. So are there any significant changes that you had, uh, maybe any new issues in the agenda that uh, you, you have to bring up now? And uh, as I'm more specializing on foreign policy issues and the IR, um, what would you name as the most significant foreign policy issues um, in your state? I mean, in New Hampshire, thank you. Oh, in New Hampshire, okay. Um, well, I think, I think in terms of, you know, many of the issues that have been on the agenda uh, legislatively are issues that I would have put on the agenda in my campaign. Healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, tax reform, in terms of reforming a code to keep really economic, uh, to keep, keep our economy the focus and keep jobs and resources uh, and investment here. And I think the third, the transportation infrastructure, his agenda, that's one that's very bipartisan and I think that they can mm -hmm. find, I hope, a lot of common ground around that um, and maybe a way to couple that with tax reform. So all of those issues I think were common issues that I certainly talked about in my campaign along with some New Hampshire specific issues like the opiate epidemic um, and, and some issues that were very specific to our state. Uh, in terms of, it's interesting that you asked the question on, on national security issues relating what do people in New Hampshire um, focus on on national security. And I think for my state, uh, it's similar to many states, which they've always, they, they look a lot at the national security issues as to um, the people who serve, right? We are a very strong veteran state, a high percentage uh, per capita of veterans. Mm -hmm. So how, um, how are those who have served being treated? Uh, how are they being treated in terms of the care that they receive and the treatment that they receive? That's an issue I heard and worked a lot on as a senator um, on behalf of my constituents. And m my, um, the people of New Hampshire, I think, are interested in the same issues that you'd see people across the country, like what's happening in Syria? What's happening with um, you know, ISIS? Are they, what's our strategy to uh, destroy ISIS and also make sure they don't continue to metastasize with either homeland attacks or attacks that they commit within our allied countries? So that was a question that I think my constituents are, you know, my, uh, in New Hampshire would be very, uh, focused on, and I, got, I, I gave a full foreign policy speech in my campaign just on what my ideas were of what more we needed to do to address ISIS. Um, and I did that at uh, the Institute of Politics oh, yeah, in, uh, yeah, at, the, at, 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 at St. Anselm. Yes, at yeah. St. Anselm. So, so those issues are um, certainly my constituents would be concerned about. But also looking at the overall of world of what's happening around the world. I mean, we have a world right now where there are so many issues 
and at play. It's, it's a time where you have um, this, what's happening in Syria which and Iraq. Uh, you have what Assad is doing. You have uh, ISIS, but you also have uh, what's going to be uh, China's policy in the South China Sea toward its neighbors. You have a North Korea with an unpredictable leader who is testing uh, you know, nuclear weapons, developing uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, we can walk around the world and I can keep going uh, of, of the number of conflict, potential conflict or actual conflict, Afghanistan we talked about around the world. And so the president inherits a very challenging time where there is still a lot of disarray around the world. And um, he is going to need to show uh, some flexibility. I'm glad today that he came out and said that he didn't think NATO was obsolete mm -hmm. because I think this is a time when we're going to, if we look at what Russia's activities are, if we look um, at what is happening around the world, uh, we do need NATO and we need to have a strong partnership with NATO. So I'm glad that he's showing some flex, what he calls flexibility in those areas because some of those views are more in line of what my views would be of what we need to do. Good. Well, I want to thank the audience. You had some great questions tonight uh, and also throughout your visit here. Um, once a visiting fellow, always a visiting fellow. So you're now in the IOP family and we want to wish you the best of luck in figuring out the next great adventure. And regardless of how that service takes place into the future, I think everybody here and those watching online um, hope that uh, you continue to serve this great nation because you bring a lot to, to the debate and to public service. Well, and thank, you've got thank, a great future. Thank you, you, Trey. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And I think to the, the students that are in the audience, I hope you decide to get in the arena yeah. and uh, run for office yourself or be involved in public service in some capacity yourself because um, it really is worth it. Uh, not saying it's always easy, but it's worth it, and our country's worth it. Yeah, and it was great seeing so many folks in the audience who actually helped her in your campaign. Yeah, it's I mean, fun. thank you. If, I, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. I appreciate it. Well, thank it. you for coming to, coming to campus. Thank you. Thank you.